Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Ferger and today for our last video of October of 2020 I'll speak a little bit about the Night Ride of the Witches to get you in the mood as Halloween is close at hand. Now, if you stick around wrong, long enough uh, somewhere on the course of this video I will also recommend at least two books on the history of witchcraft. Two of my latest acquisitions which I think to be well, really good and reliable sources on the history of witchcraft. But we shall see this further ahead. Also, uh, just one other quick note. If you check this information icon right here on the, on the right upper corner of this video, <laughs> you will see recommended videos, at least five of them I have done in the past, which I urge you to watch those um, because this video today is intimately tied to the subjects of those videos, especially the one I have entitled The Rise of the Witch, uh, which is about the demonization of women in ancient societies and, well, perpetuated by the church, which eventually gave rise to the figure of the witch, precisely. So click on this information icon right here and check the list of videos I, I have recommended um, to better accompany the content of today's video. So now I won't take much of your time uh, and <laughs> well, let's delve into today's subject and I do hope you enjoy it. Please. In the study of sources concerning witchcraft and witches and their doings, we often come about the phenomenon of the night flight, which is basically the idea that witches flew to their Sabbaths to meet with other witches and occasionally with the devil. And this idea of the night flight uh, has its roots in the pagan custom of the night ride, which possibly, possibly, it may also have links to with the, the, the famous wild hunt, although I still have my doubts as to the authenticity of the wild hunt as truly being an ancient pagan conception, as well as doubts concerning its antiquity in the minds of European pagan peoples of the past. Still, it's clear that the night flight is related to the pagan custom of the night ride. The idea of the night ride is a strong indicator of the influence that the pagan goddess Diana and other figures associated with her had on the minds of clergy um, and it helped on the formation of the classic witch stereotype. As far as I could find, the goddess Diana is the only pagan goddess mentioned by name in the New Testament. Because indeed the cult of Diana had uh, like a considerable importance in classical antiquity and continued to have during the Middle Ages. Which is strangely surprising because one of the most important religious manifestations of the classical world, especially during the Empire, the Roman Empire, uh, was actually the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis. And even in Rome, especially in Rome, in the early stages of Christianity, the entire religion around Isis was competing directly with Christianity, early Christianity. And it almost won. And nowadays things would have been quite different. And uh, indeed, uh, and, uh, instead of Christianity, the great majority of the Western world would be worshipping Isis by now. And almost that almost happened, and I wonder how different things would have been. Anyway, Diana uh, indeed became associated with many folk beliefs involving goddess-like supernatural figures, such as Herodias and Frau Hohn, which the Catholic Church wished to demonize. And um, a couple of goddesses and their cults were eventually incorporated uh, in the figure of Diana, such as the Hellenic goddess Ekat. In the Middle Ages, legends of nighttime processions of spirits led by a female figure were recorded by the church all across northern Italy, western Germany, and also southern France, always pointing out to Diana as being the leader of witches, the goddess of the pagans, the one leading these night rides. I've already spoken about this on the video about Diana, precisely, <laughs> uh, which you can see right here in this uh, information icon uh, on the right upper corner. Now, the cult of Diana grew 
to such proportions among those who still kept, to a certain extent, uh, pagan traditional practices and beliefs that many local churches across Europe, but mainly Italy, Germany and France, uh, complained that uh, women believed they were following Diana or Herodias into the night, riding out on specific nights to join the processions or, or carry out instructions from the goddess herself. And if by any chance you are also interested in knowing who this Herodias was and her importance in the Middle Ages, precisely, uh, here's another <laughs> recommended video. But the night ride phenomenon also has its origins on the pagan legends of blood-sucking strigai, uh, from the Latin strix. Uh, which was both the term for owls, the bird, <laughs> and also uh, a flying supernatural being present in Roman mythology that sucked blood in order to survive. A sort of vampire uh, owl-like creature. And indeed, the Romans were afraid of owls, mostly because it was believed magic women, uh, we later labeled witches, would turn into owls, hence uh, the modern Italian name for witch, which is strega from the Latin strix, plural striges or strixes, uh, which in the Middle Ages would be known as strigai, which is owl, <laughs> a spirit entity, a genus uh, in the form of a, an owl, as a bird of ill omen feeding on human flesh in Roman antiquity. The strix enters somewhat in the same category of the Icelandic krila, a giantess who feeds upon the flesh of mischievous children or snatches away babies, just like Lilith of the Hebraic myths and Lamia from the Greek myths, vampiric-like women who eat babies, but they weren't originally that. And notice what the Strix, Grilla, Lilith and Lamia have in common. Women who, who, who eat babies. Conceptions of patriarchal societies taking away the power of matriarchal cultures they came in contact with, in which women were linked to the priesthood uh, and acted as spiritual leaders, shaman women, uh, sorceresses, prophetesses, and so on and so forth. Uh, remember my video, uh, Rise of the Witch? If you haven't watched that already, it might help you out where I explain this in more detail. But yes, indeed, the night ride of witches also has its origins in the pagan folktales of Striga and Lamia, uh, which developed into owl-like demon women who were believed to fly through the night uh, air <laughs> to suck the blood of humans. And this development of the demonization of women actually starts during pagan times in great patriarchal civilizations of the past, such as the, the entire Hellenic cultural world and throughout the Roman Empire as well. Taking out the power of women and demonizing them so that the patriarchal religious manifestations would take hold and prevail, which is precisely the main reason why Christianity won in the first place and not the great cult of Isis, the religion of Isis, which had spread all over the Roman Empire. Again, uh, it's actually important to, to watch that video I have done on the rise of the witch to understand this development of the demonization of women in ancient pagan societies and perpetuated, of course, by the church. And this is exactly where the conception of witches originated from and their night rides across the sky. These beliefs were themselves largely influenced by the legends of the baby-killing demons Lilith and Lamia, which I also speak about in that video. Uh, Lilith, as you know it, according to Hebrew legend, was the first wife of Adam, created not from his rib, but from the earth itself, just as he was. And this obviously convinced Lilith that she was Adam's equal and not his inferior. And the couple had many conflicts because of this, and after a time Lilith flew away and left poor Adam with nothing but his own hands, and so she flew off into the desert with her demon lovers. 
and Lilith became a demon, a demonic and a vengeful figure who took the life of newborn babies in return for the lives of her own demon children. So it's interesting to notice in here the demonization of women in Hebrew society of the past uh, as well. The, the actual demonization of pagan cults and mythologies of the past the Hebrews did not wish to perpetuate. So they demonized all these myths involving women. Just the same way the Greeks, or throughout the Hellenic cultural world, demonized, minimized and disempowered important female figures such as Lamia, Circe and Medea. And, well, quite similar to all of this is precisely the previously mentioned Lamia, a Libyan queen who also became a baby killer after the murder of her own children at the hands of the goddess Hera, who discovered that Lamia was the lover of her husband Zeus. So Lamia, in her grief, became a vengeful demon as well, taking revenge by killing the children of other people. So you see here the parallels, right? Um, and the denigrating image of women uh, created to suffocate more matriarchal systems of belief as well as religious manifestations of the past. I'm not here blabbering uh, or turning away from the main subject. Those of you who know me, <laughs> you know perfectly well that everything in my videos is connected and I need, I, I just need to create context first to better explain things. So indeed, all these previously mentioned folk beliefs, legends and myths gradually became very confusing, all mixed together. And over the course of the later Middle Ages, the stereotype of the diabolical flying witch was born or was created. The figure of the witch is indeed a great mixture of ideas, legends, myths and conceptions, all originating in the need to snatch away the power from matriarchal societies, repress the cult of female entities as the great patriarchal societies of the past grew and had the need to create a strong foothold and that could only be happen with the widespread notions that women were not to be trusted and were demons uh, and were baby snatching blood sucking demons uh, flying in the night when everyone is peacefully sleeping and being guided by their great goddess which became Diana in the Middle Ages as a later figure incorporating the characteristics of various goddesses most of which precisely goddesses connected to the magical arts and cults and religious practices of women. The belief that witches flew was not universally accepted in the Christian world, however, and much debate took place actually about whether witches actually flew to their Sabbaths or not. There are entire studies, very long and very complex studies, demonstrating a variety of facts and reasons as to why witches do not fly or why they fly. The same way as the great and ponderous studies on the conceptions of demons, especially the incubus and succubus, incubi and succubi, and why they want to have sex with humans, the reasons and wishes and the nature behind it all. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating stuff. But indeed, not everyone within the clergy believed that witches actually flew. It was debated if such night rides took place or if women merely imagined that they flew. This is the same debate on the figure of the devil itself. Uh, there was great debate, especially among the Catholic Church of Portugal and also Spain, if women actually met with the devil, or if the devil was even real and snatched women away, or if women were delusional and simply concocted that fantasy in their heads. And this debate was actu actually very important because those who believed the devil was real were always ready to condemn women, torture them and burn them, uh, kill them. And those who thought it was simply a delusion or a fantasy or the power of suggestion fermented by fear actually saved many women. But when Protestantism came along, 
The devil's existence was no longer a question of debate, but a certainty. And then the great witch trials began, and there were 50 times more trials and deaths in Protestant countries than in Catholic countries. So those debates were, were actually quite important, and it was a question of life or death for many women, and of course for other people, such as men and also children, uh, that were suspected of practicing witchcraft. So for a, a very long time uh, there were these two opposing ideas if witches flew or not. But of course, eventually, as you can see, the idea that witches did fly became a prevailing concept. Uh, not a full acceptance, of course, obviously, but the great majority believed in it and that prevailed and was deeply rooted in our collective consciousness ever since. But in England, for instance, as an example, uh, witches did not fly. There wasn't this idea and women accused of witchcraft by English law were never accused and tried for flying. Continental European witches were popularly believed to fly to their sabbats in the backs of demons in the shape of animals, or on uh, forked sticks, pitchforks, shovels, baskets, and of course, a lot more frequent, on broomsticks. And every religious manifestation of continental Europe has always had great influence upon other countries. So in Scandinavia, for instance, uh, the, the, the religious Christian pressure of continental Europe of the Middle Ages uh, eventually reached nobility in Scandinavia of the late Viking period. And in order to survive and continue to trade with continental Europe, monarchs and nobility in general eventually forced Christianity onto their subjects. And it wasn't actually hard <laughs> since most Scandinavians at least since the 9th century, already knew about Christianity and many had already adopted it or incorporated Christ as yet another god in their pagan pantheon. So, eventually, the continental belief that witches could fly spread all over the place and we still have that image carved in our minds. Witches on broomsticks. <laughs> Now, of course, you might be wondering, but Arif, uh, this night ride thingy and flying, surely it has something to do with the drugs or something. Precisely. <laughs> In sources of the Middle Ages and modern period, early modern period, uh, about witchcraft and witches and concerning their night flights, we often come about special ointments, supposedly used by witches so they could fly away into the night. Um, it was quite the popular belief about witches that they flew, actually flew, with the aid of a special ointment which was given to them when they first signed their pact with the devil. But of course, some believed that this ointment would physically allow witches to actually fly, whilst others believed that it led to the illusion of flying or allowed witches to fly and attend the Sabbath in spirit when in truth she was sleeping. And as said before, the debate if witches were able to fly or not, this was another important argument. When someone was accused of witchcraft, uh, and, and for those who believed the devil was real and witches physically met with the devil in their sabbats, um, it was important when the accused had witnesses, proving that such women never actually left the house because they were sleeping beside their husbands all the time, all along. So they never actually left and never met with the devil. So it would have been impossible meeting with the devil and flying away and do witchy stuff. But those who were really inclined and made all the efforts to accuse people and lead them to the stake uh, came up with the idea that witches would fly in spirit. So they could very well be asleep beside their husbands, but that wasn't proof enough 
that they were innocent of being in league with the devil. <laughs> and, and, and another argument uh, to reinforce that witches indeed could fly away and meet with the devil and, uh, and that their body in bed wasn't proof enough of their innocence was precisely that when witches physically flew, they left demons in bed in their place when they flew off to the Sabbath. So their husbands would never know they were missing and assumed they had been there all along. <laughs> uh, but in truth, it was a decoy, a demon to replace the missing witch. As you can see, all sorts of arguments were forcibly created to accuse and punish women at all costs, to the point that such arguments were beyond all reasoning and beyond scientific explanation, which led many members of the clergy to speak out against these fantasies and show scientific proof that all of this was impossible. And you know perfectly well what happened to those clergymen as well. Uh, if they were using science and reasoning, they were surely in league with the devil and were trying to cover up evidences of witchcraft. So they too ended up in the stake at some point. And unfortunately, this is happening again nowadays in, in plain 21st century. Many people abandoning reason and science and embracing all sorts of conspiracy theories without a hint of truth in them and clearly forcibly concocted delusions whose aim is to simply demonstrate at all costs that such delusions are real. It doesn't matter if it's reasonable, if it's true, or if the arguments are well structured. Just pure gibberish to live within a lie and force it to, uh, to others, uh, force them to accept it. Anyway, <laughs> returning to the ointments, uh, indeed there are various recipes for these so-called flying ointments, many of which have been recorded uh, and others remain in folk tradition actually. And the recent scientific experiments have analyzed some of these recipes and scientists came up with some pretty interesting conclusions. Uh, a significant number of recipes really did contain hallucinogenic uh, ingredients that not only cause the sensation of flying but also make the user believe they have been traveling across vast expanses of terrain and undergoing strange experiences. But we have to be careful with such assumptions, of course. Uh, I have spoken about this in the video about Berserkir and Hülfedin, uh, precisely in the, in the assumption that such formidable legendary warriors of old Norse society consumed either cannabis or Amanita muscaria or even handbane, commonly known as stinking nightshade. I have developed this on, on that video, so I'm not going to repeat myself again. But indeed, we need to be careful with such assumptions. And on that video, I have actually demonstrated a recipe of, for a, a witch's uh, ointment, uh, precisely with seven herbs. But these hallucinogenic substances, the great majority of them, are actually highly poisonous. So there are several processes to mitigate the poisonous effects as well as the form of administration of such ointments, especially the administration of such ointments. <laughs> the great majority of, of these ointments were not administrated orally, and those who were, there was the need to create a filter first. Such is the case of Amanita muscaria, for instance, among Arctic societies, uh, waiting for reindeer and elk to consume the mushrooms and collect their urine and drink it. The animal creates a natural filter and the urine retains some of the hallucinogenic properties, but attenuated. So when it comes to the witch's ointments, uh, most were not actually administrated orally, but via other parts of the body. Some were selves spread across the chest to inhale, or in most cases placed under, under the armpits, so the skin may absorb it. As I said, many ingredients were highly poisonous, so it would certainly kill if 
ingested because it would have to be digested and shut down many organs. So this is precisely why most of them were administrated on the skin. So it would be absorbed and enter in the bloodstream that way without having to cause a lot of damage to the internal organs as the skin served as a sort of natural filter. And this is when we enter in the typical stereotype of the witch riding a broom or some other object that suggests a, suggests a phallic shape. The best skin to absorb any product, any salve, any ointment is not the external skin, but the soft, hot and wet internal skin. Many of these ointments were administrated either uh, vaginal or rectal way with the aid of phallic objects, precisely with a cylindrical shape to better fit and administrate the ointments that way. Um, and this doesn't mean these objects were actually brooms, right? And, and everything that suggests a phallic shape. There were specific objects for this purpose, but uh, it progressively became uh, the target of satire, creating this idea of brooms, pitchforks, shovels, these stuffs, all those sort of objects which were set to ride, which is worth set to ride uh, as a form of, of a joke and also to denigrate the image of such women as using anything that slightly suggests a phallus. But indeed, these cylindrical objects are not uncommon to be found in archaeological contexts, even as early as the Neolithic. Uh, we are talking about basically dildos. Uh, and what di differentiates, differentiates ancient dildos for pleasure and ancient dildos for magical religious purposes is precisely the latter having symbolic engravings of a religious character. Not always, but it's an important characteristic in them. Uh, and since this channel is mostly about Scandinavian studies, uh, such objects often come in the written sources, Old Norse written sources, and are so named Gondur. And they have also been found, actually, uh, pretty hard to find, but not impossible. Of course, we must not discard the idea that some of these objects were indeed sex toys and others were for religious cultic purposes, but some are indeed found in shamanic or magical cultic contexts since prehistoric times of both male and female contexts. And indeed, in Scandinavian context of the Viking period, it's obviously close to impossible to find these objects, as they were made of wood, uh, perishable materials. But in the Old Norse written sources concerning Seidr and also the Volur, the prophetesses or, or the seeresses of Old Norse society, the gondul is often mentioned, which is a wand-like utensil, phallic in shape, one of the most important tools of the Volva, actually, uh, of the prophetess or the soothsayer, and it, 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 it does literally mean penis. <laughs> I've explored that on other videos, on the video about Gulveig as well, which I'll leave the link below in the description, so check it. The point here is that such objects have been found, they existed, and in magical religious contexts uh, in archaeology they have been interpreted or associated with sex magic or achieving an ecstatic state through sexual intercourse. But the likely scenario here is precisely as tools to administrate ointments in the body, inside the body. What would be later called witches' ointments in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And from these tools we start to have the imagery of witches riding brooms <laughs> and such other objects similar in, sh in shape, possibly starting as a code or a an inside joke, but it took huge proportions and quite the negative connotations. And well, uh, since we are speaking about negative connotations and the typical stereotype of the witch, aside from the broom and flying through the air, what other element we see often depicted in the image of the witch? Pointy hats, precisely. I might now completely shatter all the fantasies we have been living concerning pointy hats in witches, and I promise you, you, you the, the, the next time you see a person dressed as a witch for Halloween and with a pointy hat, 
you won't be able to see it the same way as you did before. Anyway, uh, the witch's pointy hat is obviously related to the persecution of witches during the medieval period. To be more precise, it all started in the year of 1431, when those who were arrested on the charges of witchcraft were ordered to wear this so-called Jew's hat. A pointed cap the Jewish people in Hungary were forced to wear in order to publicly identify them. That's the origins of the witch's pointy hat. From an anti Semitic stereotype in Hungary to identify those who were Jewish and as anti-Semitic propaganda spreads from the part of the church and accusing the Jewish people of witchcraft, sorcery and causing all the evils of the world, in the 15th century the, the hat to public, publicly shame Jewish people in Hungary was adopted by the church in general to identify those who were accused of practicing witchcraft, forced to use the hat to publicly shame them as well. In this way, when people nowadays unknowingly dress as witches with a pointy hat, it is extremely racist and xenophobic. But returning to the ointments, well, as you know it, everything by the hands of the church was purposely uh, altered and exaggerated, so in later sources we have made up recipes with grotesque ingredients such as the fat of unbaptized babies and soot and bat's blood, <laughs> concocted recipes as proof in trials for the evil doings of witches and to put fear in the hearts of, of the people. Careful now, you bloody peasants, if you do not baptize your baby, there is a great chance that your fat little piglet will end up in the witch's cauldron. After all, unbaptized babies are surely the devil's children and will end up in hell. But of course, we have real recipes and it's pretty interesting that there are at least three herbs that were commonly used alongside with other herbs and those were belladonna, also commonly known as deadly nightshade, handbane, as said before, commonly known as stinking nightshade, <laughs> and aconite, <laughs> commonly known as wolfsbane or monkshood, uh, which is one of the most deadly poisons, as you know it. Three highly poisonous herbs with hallucinogenic properties, surely, but they can't be consumed orally, and not directly either. Other herbs serve to mitigate the poison of these three deadly little bastards, as well as the way in which these ointments were administrated, was to be taken seriously, as previously said. Many important recipes whose ingredients have been the subject of recent scientific studies were recorded in the past by the Bavarian court, as well as by Austrians. There is indeed one interesting account of a man who encountered a witch in Linz, in Austria, where she gave him an ointment to rub on his wrist. You see here the importance of the, the skin to absorb the ointment. And the man recorded his experience. He wrote about it. A vivid sensation of flying through the air and arriving at the place he had wished to visit. And after this initial experience, he decided to take a second experiment and wished to see what the ointment physically did to the witch who had given him this ointment. He wished her to visit a friend of his, far off, and to report what she had seen to compare, to compare with his own experience. And she rubbed the ointment on her wrists and on her feet, but instead of actually flying as the man expected, she fell to the floor as though dead for several hours. When she finally came back to herself, she described the journey, not as the actual journey to the man's friend was supposed to be described. So the man concluded that the ointment induced fantastical dream flights. This is a very important account. Witches were getting high. <laughs> 
Of course, this account and such others doesn't diminish the fact that indeed with the administration of such product, products, one is able to have an out-of-body experience or projecting one's mind in any way. It surely leads to an unconscious state of the mind that may induce a near-death experience. And as you know it perfectly well, near-death experiences are precisely the fundamental states of both, of, of both the mind and the body uh, in initiations to become a shaman. And it's precisely the survival from such an experience that officially makes a person a shaman after the, the contact with the spirit world. But this doesn't also take away the fact that there is a great deal of hallucination as well as things get mixed together and it's hard to discern the truth and what actually happened. <laughs> There is an important medieval document which I've talked about on the video about Diana, precisely. Uh, and, and the document is the Canon Episcopi from around the 12th century, which warns bishops that they must do whatever it is in their power to uproot sorcery and witchcraft and all the wicked doings provoked and created by the devil. It is a war on the devil. It specifically speaks about the cult of Diana from the part of the pagans, which gives us indications that these there were still strong religious and cultic practices towards pagan deities of the past, even during the 12th century. Of course, we must not forget that the great, in great part, uh, the great part of the success of the Catholic Church was precisely allowing some pagan festivities to carry on and incorporating pagan beliefs within the religious structure of the Church, as well as writing extensively about pagan gods and pagan mythology, but with Christian interpretations to reinforce the new faith and implement it upon the minds of the people. But in South and Central Europe, the cult of Diana was apparently still strong in the Middle Ages among those who carried on pagan traditional practices and beliefs to a certain extent. To the Germans, it was actually mostly Frau Holm, but with a considerable amount of characteristics from Diana. Diana was, by this time, the Middle Ages, indeed seen as the great goddess of the pagans. And with her, women would fly and dedicate their cultic practices to Diana. So the cult of Diana was still very active. And as such, according to the Canon Episcopi, it was the belief that women rode out at night with Diana that was actually wrong. You see, there were many pagans, apparently, <laughs> still, and worshipping Diana. And the pagan belief that women could or would fly with Diana was wrong on the point of view of the church. Not because of Diana herself, and not because people were still worshipping a pagan deity, but the, church, the church's views on this belief was that Diana and the night flight with her were actually illusions of the devil. This is precisely the moment when the church sort of gets tired of people still holding on to some pagan beliefs and traditions and even worshipping pagan gods and, and, and the pagan gods start to be believed by the church as uh, to be illusions of the devil. To the church there is nothing beyond the Christian faith from this moment onwards. Anything that isn't perceived to be Christian, it was surely an illusion of the devil. So with the Canon Episcopi, the church starts a relentless war against the devil and uh, uprooting every type of pagan worship, sorcery, witchcraft, anything that was slightly understood to be the work of the devil. And since Diana at this time was of major importance among many of the common and ordinary peoples of the medieval societies in Europe, the night flight with Diana was understood by the church to be yet another illusion of the devil. Therefore, believing in the night ride was a false opinion, and those who believed in it wandered astray from the right faith. Whether they were pagan or Christian, 
But if they were Christian, it was even worse because it was assumed they believed in the same errors of the ignorant pagans when they thought that there, there was anything divine or powerful beyond the one true God. With the canon, canon episcopy, uh, a lot of things actually changed in the religious panorama in Europe. And it's from this moment that all those previously previous arguments start to pop out. If witches could fly or not, if the devil is real or not, if the night flights were a thing or just fantasy or, or, or an illusion, and if such illusions were provoked by the devil or if women were delusional. But by the end of the 15th century, the Dominican altars of the witch hunting manual Maleos Malificarum changed some of the ambiguous points of the Canon Episcopi. The Maleos Malificarum stated that although canon law stated that it was wrong for witches to believe they flew, it might not necessarily follow that they didn't actually fly anyway. You see, there came a new idea. It did not matter if witches could physically fly or not. It did not matter anymore if they were dreaming and traveling in spirit. The devil was real. As such, it had a physical form. And as such, witches could be physically taken away by the devil. Boom. Mind blown on all the Christians across Europe and beyond of the 15th century. It was believed that the witches' sabbaths took place in remote and inaccessible regions. And since it was established now that the devil had power over local motion, the devil could magically lift and transport people through the air <laughs> and get them down uh, great distances away. So witches by the late 15th century were no longer flying by their own means or in brooms, but lifted in the air by the devil. The night ride uh, referred to by the ca Canon Episcopi and later on by the Maleos Malificarum was a lingering pagan belief which the church was keen on eradicating. Many women in this, at, at this point during the 15th century were believed to join the spirits of the dead in nocturnal processions led by Diana, in which they rode on the backs of beasts and went from house to house performing beneficent acts. In France and Italy, women were known as the good society, or also as the women of the good game. In Germany, the fertility goddesses uh, Holda or Hol or Perkta was the leader of the same procession, where it was known as the wild hunt or the wild chase or the wild ride. Holda also led the furious horde, uh, the spirits of those who had died young, and led them across the skies at night. So you see why I am always reluctant uh, to believe that the famous wild hunt was actually a very ancient pagan conception. Because, well, it doesn't seem so. And now you also know and understand why I have said before that Odin, or his continental Germanic predecessor, Wotan, uh, wasn't the original leader of the wild hunt. Because... These night rides across the sky, these spiritual processions with the dead were led by goddesses before Odin actually became relevant. And the proof of this lies in the belief of pagan goddesses leading the dead across the skies. And this belief was still very strong at least until the 15th century. But this idea of a night ride and riding on beasts and with the spirits isn't exclusively of societies of continental Europe. In Scandinavia, we have these two. I've spoken about this several times, actually. Uh, one of the examples I've given was precisely uh, Frostbera Frost, Frost Saga, the saga of the Sworn Brothers, which is one of the Icelanders' sagas. The saga itself is in relation to events of the 11th century. And there is a particular passage, and I quote, <laughs> I have caused the Gandir to run far into the night, and I have now become wise about those things that I did not know before. This speaks of a woman prophetess who sends out her helping spirits into the night. 
she sends forth her helping spirits to find things for her, to tell her prophecy, divination. And indeed, the night ride was often associated with divination and riding with the dead and the spirits to acquire hidden knowledge, to acquire divination. And, and there's no point in repeating myself. I have spoken about these Gandhir before in both the video of helping spirits in Seder as well as the one about Gulfaik. Please check the links uh, to those videos down below in the description of this video. But in those videos, I have come to the conclusion that such helping spirits are often described as being animals, mostly wolves and serpents in Scandinavia. Animals that the sorceresses and prophetesses of pre-Christian Scandinavian uh, society would ride, not particularly across the sky, but mostly at night in prophetic rituals, in Seder ceremonies, and they would ride great distances in search for answers so they could prophesy. And we have indeed many Old Norse written sources, including mythological accounts of female figures riding wolves or being associated with wolves, such as Angraboda and Hirokin, uh, and quite possibly Heidre, and always figures associated with divination, magic, prophecy, associated with the figure of the Volva, uh, the Old Norse Cirrus or Soothsayer, and riding animals, beasts, monsters, just like the medieval witches of continental Europe. So you see, this was a very common idea all across Europe of, of a, a night ride across the sky or traveling great distances in the wind and over terrain. A night ride of women seeking knowledge and prophecy for divination purposes mostly. And always a female figure or a goddess associated with this phenomenon. Anyway, um, well, speaking of pre-Christian Scandinavia, and since this channel is mostly about Scandinavian studies, uh, let's talk a little bit about the night ride or the witch ride of women in the, in the Old Norse society. But before that, I have something for you. Now, as it was promised, I'm going to show you two books which I think to be very good and reliable sources about the history of witchcraft. I know how hard it is to find reliable sources because as soon as you look for books about witchcraft, uh, you will get a long list, a very long list of New Age stuff on how to become a witch, how do you know you are a witch, how to be a witch, how to do witchcraft, as if such a thing was simply taught like that and snap your fingers and that's it, congratulations. <laughs> you are a witch and now you can go on social media. Uh, annoy everybody with memes about magic and how everybody else is wrong. There is too much New Age stuff and I have no doubt that there are good perspectives and good advice to be given, but witchcraft isn't a religion. You simply learn and perform in just that specific way. So, it's pretty hard to get by reliable historical information uh, because any book can contain witchcraft in the title and it could be anything really. So, the first book is The Witch, <laughs> uh, A History of Fear from Ancient Times to the Present by Ronald Hutton. I'm not going to make a book review, obviously, uh, but know that this is one of my latest acquisitions and I found the book to be extremely useful and uh, a really good and recent reliable source on the history of witchcraft. Uh, also, nothing that was said in this video today or any other video during this month or previous videos I have done about witchcraft, nothing uh, in those videos um, contain any information found in this book. I have done that on purpose. Uh, I have used other sources and not this book or the other one I will show you next. Uh, I haven't used them to create these videos because I did not want to spoil you and ruin the books before you even got the chance to read them. So I'm sure you will find a lot of useful information in them. And <laughs> this book has been gnawed on the corners by two of my other latest acquisitions rescued on the streets. My 
little two girls somewhere around here. Here's one of them, little soul. <laughs> now, uh, the other book uh, is the Oxford Illustrated History of Witchcraft and Magic uh, by Owen Davies, uh, which is one of the contributors and the editor. But this has many other contributors, such as Ritter Voltmer, uh, James Sharp, and Sophie Page, and so on and so forth. Uh, a, sh a shorter one, easy to read, but the content is succinct and much synthesized, but keeps the information very up-to-date and very useful, providing an overview of various cultures and civilizations concerning magical arts and witchcraft. And it has also been gnawed by those little devils. <laughs> now, let's continue with our video of today, just a little bit more concerning uh, the witch ride, but in the Old Norse society. Please. In Northern Europe, both Old Norse Scandinavian sources as well as Icelandic sagas, we have an interesting phenomenon called the witch ride. There's really no other way to say it, or, or perhaps there is, but nothing better occurs to me right now. Anyway, in Old Norse and medieval Icelandic society, there were a couple of terms to describe practitioners of specific magic. For instance, uh, there was the Volva, a prophetess or a seeress, the Seidkona, uh, a, a woman practitioner of Seidr, Spokona, uh, a woman who was able to make divination, uh, Vinzindekona, uh, a wise woman, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, several terms which I'll show you in here, with a very pejorative meaning, uh, the derogatory terms, all with the approximate meaning of witch, which is also another pejorative term. And then there is a, a special category of terms for female sorceress uh, related to sp uh, specifically to the art of writing. But what we must take into mind is that the specific terms used for women who can ride, and we shall see further ahead the meaning of this ride, is that this could be at least two types of sorceresses. A woman could perform any other magical art and also being able to and know how to perform this witch rite, which would make these, these women be prophetesses, seriouses, practitioners of Seder or anything, practicing other magical arts and also being able to perform the witch rite aside from the main practices. Or indeed, they did not practice anything at all, but, but solely the witch ride. So the witch ride seems to have been something aside from the magical performances usually practiced by women in the early Middle Ages of Northern Europe. Remember that Seidr was mainly a divination method, a ceremony and ritual in which the, the main objective was prophecy, divination, foretelling, oracular purposes. As the Old Norse Scandinavian society progressively develops and walks towards Christianization and absorbing Christian religious conceptions and perceptions, Seidr becomes the term to generally refer to magic of pagans, the general magic of the pagan women in Northern Europe. So Seidr turns from something quite specific, divination, into a general term to designate unspecified magic, just magic in general. However, the witch ride doesn't enter in Seder, neither in its early understanding of being a divinatory art, nor in its later understanding of being magic in general. The witch ride in Northern Europe was a supernatural attack often caused on a sleeping human being. The witch ride was an act performed by the sorceress or some other being, and the sorceress would ride the victim, causing discomfort in many levels, causing nightmares, injury, and even death. This is basically the same activity performed by the Mara, plural Mara, which I have spoken on the video about uh, supernatural entities in Old Norse spirituality. The Mara is literally nightmare 
which is uh, a supernatural entity that rode people in their sleep. This, is, uh, this also has parallels with uh, a very similar uh, supernatural entity of Western Slavic mythology, which is the Mora, uh, as well uh, as the Portuguese being with the exact same name, Mora or Moira, uh, which I have explored on the video about supernatural entities uh, spoken previously. Uh, it's a female entity often threatening dream creatures, which occasionally are precisely the spiritual manifestations of an evil sorceress or an agent of destruction sent by the sorcerer or the sorceress. This Mara is a post-medieval belief which in time developed into real women that could ride and cause all sorts of trouble and even death when someone was sleeping. We see the, the same parallels here with the Roman Strix, uh, which develops from a nightmare owl-like creature into a blood-sucking and baby-snatching witch that rides across the sky. The same parallel of the development of night creatures into riding witches as the religious background in Europe changes from pagan to Christian. One of the very best sources of the witch ride is Heriviya Saga, and the, the, the same account can be also found within the Lendama book. Uh, there's really no point in uh, ponderously describe the event, but there's a man named Gunnlaug who is killed by a woman, he was ridden by her, and it is thought to have been a prophetess, but in fact it was another woman who killed him out of jealousy. She rode the man during the night in spirit. She cut his flesh in a nightmarish attack. The woman who did it was charged as being a Gvelrida, an evening rider. So these women who could ride either in a nightmare or a supernatural attack by sending their spiritual forms were called Kveldrider, and in later law codes, the same type of activity and women are called Trollrider, as, as Troll was originally to designate magic or entities or people possessors of magic. But it progressively became a, a, a derogatory term to describe witchcraft. So Trollrider was basically riders of the Troll. Uh, but in this context, writers of witchcraft. This idea of witches writing something became quite popular in Europe throughout the Middle Ages and, of course, the early modern period. And indeed, many female entities in Norse mythology, usually giantesses who are supernatural entities, naturally possessors of magic, were often described in similar terms, such as Mirk Rida, Darkness Rider or Night Rider, uh, Moon Rider, Mouth Rider, etc. The idea of riding in here is connected to a shape shifting aspect when such women took on a form of another being to attack a victim. But also, sometimes this riding aspect is literally mounting on supernatural creatures, often a wolf, as was said before, and I've explored on, on the video about Gulveig, uh, that wolf thingy, uh, you, 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 can, you can check in, in the description. So again, uh, this bears close parallels with other witches and the night ride phenomenon all across Europe, both their animal forms and also the creatures and beasts they rode in the night processions or going into their sabbaths. So it's actually particularly interesting to notice uh, the Norse goddess Freya, riding a boar, a wild boar. Surely, Freya literally means the lady, and it's a title rather than an actual name, as she was mainly a goddess related to nobility, royalty even, especially of Sweden, and the boar was considered to be a noble animal of the warrior dynasty of southern Swedes. But in the poem, Hindulyod, Freya rides on a boar, and this creature is itself sorceress by nature. It is a magical creature, because it isn't an actual domesticated animal, 
but in truth it is a human male warrior who has attracted Freya's attention, and she transformed him into a wild pig. Hiltis Fini, battle swine. So she actually rides a man whom she loves or feels some attraction towards that man, uh, which fits into the account of Hervigia Saga, the woman riding and killing a man out of jealousy because he loved another and she couldn't stand to be left aside for the love he had for a prophetess. So there may indeed have been some connection between Freya and this night ride, uh, the witch ride in Northern Europe. But we have to be careful with this because Freya, riding a man, she turned into a wild boar, indeed comes in the poem I've mentioned, uh, Hinduljod, uh, which is preserved in its entirety only in the Fleteria book, uh, which is a medieval Icelandic manuscript which was commissioned by Jon Arhönorsson, who was a Christian, and the manuscript itself was composed by two priests, Christian priests. So how far do we see a Christian influence in here? Perhaps trying to precisely push the Catholic understanding of witches riding animals across the sky and incorporating that belief in the image of Freya herself and her wild boar. I have no doubt that she was associated with the wild boar as a powerful animal symbol of the warrior nobility. But this aspect of riding the wild boar, who is a man, may be an attempt to link the knight ride and the witch ride to the figure of Freya, since she was understood to be the goddess of Seder, but in here Seder was already being used as a general term to designate the magic of the pagan women. So perhaps the attempt here was indeed to try to turn Freya into the Scandinavian equivalent of Diana in continental Europe as the goddess of the pagans in the Middle Ages. But uh, as, as said before, we, we do have a couple of female figures in the, in the Norse myths uh, connected to magic, sorcery, pro prophecy and riding on animals, usually wolves. But as said before, I've already developed that on the video about Gulveig, so please, if you have the time, of course, check the description of this video and you shall find the, the, link, the, links to that, the link to that video and other links uh, where I explore several subjects um, presented uh, in this video in more depth. <laughs> All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, give it a like, share it among your friends and uh, all across the online world. Saul bids you farewell. <laughs> and as you can see, there's another one in there. <laughs> That's Gigi. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for watching again. See you on the next video and have a happy Halloween. Goodbye. Ta frida. <laughs>